All right. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Vikram Gandhi. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School, and I'm going to be moderating our, our panel this morning. And we have a very, very interesting topic. Uh, the topic of the panel is not out of the manager's textbook, coping post-COVID. Uh, the fact that it says post-COVID, I think we've been very optimistic and hopeful that we're always think, already thinking about post-COVID. But the purpose of this panel is twofold. One is to really bring, bring the business lens to the issue of COVID-19 and what does it actually do, if anything, to business strategy, to the CEO imperatives, how should CEOs and boards be looking at strategy going forward, and what, how, will, how will the workplace change, how will the mode of operation change? So that's one of our key focus areas. And if, I mean, I've lived through the global financial crisis in 2008, I think a lot of our, all our panelists probably have and most of our audience probably has. Uh, and that time when we had that crisis, it was, this is a one in a hundred year crisis, India, quite honestly, didn't get that impacted by it. Uh, and people felt that, okay, we are done with our big crisis for our generation and we'll worry about things. And here, 12, 12 years later, we have a crisis which no one could have even fathomed. And it has hit India front and center. I mean, if, if I look at the US statistics, um, the unemployment claims and unemployment levels uh, in COVID were 10 times that as was in the global financial crisis. And clearly, since a lot of our audience is from India, you can see front and center the implications of what COVID has done, the lockdowns have done, and other things have done to business activity and economic activity over the last uh, three months. So to talk about this, we've uh, assembled a fantastic panel with uh, varied backgrounds uh, in technology, financial services, infrastructure, policy. And you all have their, uh, their bios, but briefly, we have, we have Parag Amin, who's the chief mentor and founding director of iCreate. Sunil Kanoria, who's the vice chairman of Shrey Infrastructure Finance Limited. Rajiv Lal, who's the chairman of IDFC Bank. Rakesh Murali, who's the co-founder of Stratonic. And Prashanti Reddy, who's executive member of the Bombay Management Association. Details of their backgrounds are in the, in the uh, uh, conference materials. So welcome all. We're really looking forward to a, a fantastic uh, discussion here in the next uh, 45 minutes. And uh, very, very grateful that you're here and, and with us. So one of the questions that we wanted to kind of just, and I'll probably just go alphabetically here, is to really, since you all are coming to this issue, even though it's a business lens, from different perspectives, it would be really wonderful to hear that what you think are one, of the, one or two key changes you believe that need to be made in terms of the CEO focus and corporate strategy in the medium to long term as a result of COVID. Um, so maybe we start with you, Parag. Uh, yes, uh, good evening to everybody from where I am. Good morning to you. Uh, can you guys hear me all? Yeah, in fact, with the other panelists, we just put us ourselves on mute while whoever's speaking. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Parag. Okay, yes. So, um, like earlier you mentioned, this is a once in a hundred year kind of an event. And I think there were no pundits that could have predicted it. Uh, there are no magic pills. And there are no uh, basically formulas that any country can follow. I think everybody is trying to figure out within the realm of their own paradigms uh, how best to kind of move forward. One thing is for sure, no matter which part of the world you're in, I have in the US, I work with India uh, very extensively, but 30% of everything, broadly speaking, that we know is going to go away. Whether you talk about airlines, you talk about banks, you talk about restaurants, you talk about whatever it is. Uh, and, and the going away part is uh, going to be attributed to multiple things. One is the shrinkage in demand. Second is uh, social distancing. And, and third is just people or companies that are not able to sustain themselves through these crises will go away regardless. So if you don't have runway, then you're going to be gone no matter what. Uh, so having said that, and that 30% might be 27, it might be 35. Broadly speaking, a third of everything we know is going to go away. So in every adversity lies multiple opportunities. So people that will survive uh, or are on the 70% uh, uh, spectrum of, 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 of that equation, uh, they will have a tremendous opportunity at hand. Uh, the challenge that they have is their customers are going to trickle in slowly because this is not a switch. Uh, and they have to retain their employees. So what has happened is traditionally as business leaders, we all used to think that the customer was the final entity. 
Well, that paradigm is going to shift on us a little bit, and our employees are going to be far more important than just our customers. Because if you don't have your employees, you're not going to be able to serve your customers. So your, your human asset immediately now is a far more valuable asset than it was in the past, because especially in industries that require a lot of domain knowledge. So just, just to keep it kind of small, 30% of things are going to go away. Uh, we're going to have to find opportunities inside of that if you are on the 70% side of the spectrum and your people are going to be your strongest focus. And we can, as we get more into this debate, we can kind of elaborate on that and, and I can give examples of real life of what I am going through and what I am seeing on the U.S. side of things. That's great. Yeah. Before I go into the next speaker, the Parag, just one, one quick thing. So are you saying that this is happening now while we have COVID? Let's assume that at some point, who knows when, in the next year, 18 months, there'll be a vaccine. People will get more comfortable. Immunity will be built. And this whole issue of social distancing and all that kind of goes away. So are you saying that, that this is in the interim or are you saying that post-COVID, 30% of everything is, is, is shrunk, is gone? Well, like I said, there are no pundits. Nobody's going to be able to make that forecast today, right? But I am saying, and from everything that I've been reading, for example, let's say Carnival Cruise Lines. They're one of my largest customers. Mm -hmm. They've already sold six of their ships this week. They're in the process of selling six more. So here is the world's largest cruise company that controls about 62% of the global cruising market. Before anything is opened, their cruising is not going to start till October or November. Right. They, they're already sensing and saying, I'm going to be gone. Airlines are doing the same thing. They have let go on their leases. They're not taking new aircrafts. So this is happening as we speak. Uh, on the larger corporate level, Boeing, you can see what's happening with their orders. The smaller restaurants in our neighborhoods are going away because they can't sustain. They're not going to be able to stay open for another three months without business. So we will see a lot of this happening. And I think over the next year, you will see that will hit that 30% number of everything going away. Got it. Okay, thank you, Parag. Maybe I can turn to you, Sunil, um, as someone who runs one of the largest inter infrastructure and finance operations in India. What are you seeing in terms of the imp implications of COVID-19, not just for your business, but for CEOs and corporate strategy? Oh, you're on mute, Sunil. Uh, the way I look at it is uh, that uh, this pandemic has brought in challenges, but also it will lead to a lot of opportunities. And this is a time, and this is what we have tried to do internally uh, in our uh, system, is to look first within, and I think three things are there. At the individual level, we need to reboot ourselves. Uh, we need to uh, look at within ourselves, look at our mind, body, and soul, exercise all those three, and see where we stand today, and what do we need to do tomorrow. The second, at the organization level, we need to challenge our business models, as uh, Parag also mentioned that many of the businesses will shrink a lot or will change business models. So we need to review right from the customer to our people that what's going to change, what's the environment, what business model we can evolve new out of what we have learned and our experiences and skill sets of our people. The second is our own people. As Parag again said, people are very important to reskill them, assessing them. And that's what we have been trying to do in the last few months using this time. To assess our people and that's connect with them and reskilling them. And the third is technology, that how technology can be utilized to basically look at our own businesses and see every business aspect can be challenged and changed the way you were doing activities. And the third, I think, is at the country level, where uh, we as corporate citizens, we have to also look at it, uh, be important to basically uh, work with the governments to see that how do we reboot the country itself. In terms of new policies, new regulations, new rules, new, new laws. And that becomes very, very important as corporate citizen to take care of that. So I would say that the three areas, if you look at the individual organization and country level, is what uh, will help us to, uh, to overcome this uh, challenge and bring in new opportunities. Also, the other thing would be to look at new opportunities of growth in terms of which will solve the problems. Uh, which the planet will be having. So some of these things will help us to uh, move ahead. What would be uh, like an example of a growth opportunity you think that comes out of the COVID situation? And again, let's talk about post-COVID where, you know, this uncertainty has gone away. I think, say, for example, when we are talking about in the infrastructure space, I think 
yeah, we've been talking about a lot of physical infrastructure which has been required and the build up is required now maybe maybe the utilization of that physical infrastructure will be less so you need to do a lot of technology infrastructure which is uh, required to be created so the focus when you are doing your business models as a infrastructure player you have to look at that what is the technology infrastructure which you need to create uh, and can there be opportunities there which uh, would emerge and grow okay great thank you also just for the audience uh, there is a chat function uh, in your screen and if you have any questions or comments please feel free to enter them and all the panelists will have access to them and we can address some of those questions as we get along go along this uh, maybe i maybe i move to uh, rajiv to you um, you've been uh, a, a big player in the last 25 years in the financial services uh, business in india um, obviously covid 19 has had a pretty dramatic effect on financial services um, how do you see things changing as a result of, of covid 19 Well, yeah. So uh, maybe to complement what other people have said, um, I will um, add a few comments uh, specifically from the perspective of financial services. Um, and there are uh, four general points. One is um, purpose. Uh, second is uh, uh, skill. Uh, third is uh, technology. and the final one i could add is uh, culture so let me start uh, very quickly with with culture um it's very closely interlinked with purpose um one of the very interesting phenomena that we found um uh, as we we are navigating the covid crisis is that this has been actually a defining period for forging our sense of purpose and actually forging a culture for the company itself uh you know previously uh, um we talk a lot about culture we talk a lot about purpose but this is one of those defining moments <laughs> where everything comes together and you know somebody mentioned how employees have become more important depending on each other in a virtual world making teams happen reacting with agility making sure that customers don't suffer under present circumstances rethinking uh, you know business models but solving problems really in real time all these things build the fundamentals of culture and clarify what your purpose is so this has been in in a in a in an interesting sense a very fortuitous and positive um for for the company um and this is one big learning but when it comes to getting past this and looking to the future and thinking about what the prospects are in financial services i think that what you are seeing what you're likely to see in the labor force which is a much greater inequality i suspect that's going to develop um access to uh, uh opportunity is going to become harder uh for the for general citizens for 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 workers i think the same is going to be true for companies and in financial services in particular therefore i believe that scale is become of vital importance i'll give you just one quick anecdote on this uh, uh whenever a crisis happens in financial services uh -oh. really a flight to safety in the current context Flight to safety. Sorry, you just cut out there the last five seconds. Sorry, you cut out there the last ten seconds, Aji. You could say it again. Yeah. Okay. So there is in financial services a flight to safety, and in the current context, flight to safety interestingly means a flight to the state sector, to the public sector. Depositors, ironically. or interesting not surprisingly feel safer with a public sector bank uh, so there's been a huge concentration of deposits savings deposits in public sector banks for private banking therefore to keep the trust of the small saver and depositor i believe scale is going to be really important and the way in which the customer is going to connect with banks technology is going to become very important so for private banking in particular those who get that technology 
customization and outreach to customers and who are able to build scale uh, in addition to forging the internal culture and retaining a sense of purpose these are the people that will survive and thanks can i ask you one thing rajiv just to little to be a little more specific if you could this purpose and culture issue was is a very important one and a very uh, interesting one what 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 has happened whether it be in your company or what you may have seen what what suddenly happened in terms of what like what revelation happened that this is now what our culture should be or this is what our purpose should be which was not the case like in january well you know uh, it's a uh, so it will be it will be enterprise specific uh, in uh, our learning through this process uh, on culture and purpose has been uh, twofold one is that uh, when you are uh, uh, silos melt away because decisions have to be made very very quickly and there is a sense then of if there is an existential threat and people feel an existential threat not just in a corporate sense but they are feeling fragile as human beings right suddenly communication and empathy with fellow employees increases very dramatically and this is a real opportunity to break down silos um in companies uh, so tech not talking to department a a not talking to b all that disappears so and that's really been magical the trick now is to keep that together and and sustained when yeah. once the crisis recedes you don't want to recede back into, into your respective silos as usual <laughs> keep that magic going that's now going to be the management challenge <laughs> great thank you rajiv uh prashanti if i may uh, go to you uh, and get your thoughts as to what needs to be changed in terms of ceo focus and corporate focus sure thank you vikram am i audible yeah uh, yeah this is a little louder please yes. okay thank you um i agree with uh, all the panelists what they're saying absolutely right um for me first and foremost would be the business to accept that this is the largest change that has come through in our life and then taking steps in uh, what to look forward for in the future when i look at it like i also work with digital transformation for businesses in uae and i also work with startups when i look at how they how they are taking small steps to make those changes happen first thing comes is absolutely changing the culture looking at how do we retain the talent that we have that parag talked about uh when we look at retaining the talent it is not only within the company it's also with the partnerships that we we are engaging with because the ecosystem is all evolving together if we if we block out some of that ecosystem then we are actually out of business if we don't take collaboration as the first step the second thing would be definitely technology like you know uh, sunil talked about cyber security now we are talking about virtual environment like all of us here globally connected earlier this conference was supposed to happen in a particular place a particular city all of us were supposed to fly in there meet together physically but now in the matter of days like we've changed our entire strategy to be here on virtually that calls for a lot of cyber threats cyber threats for companies who are working uh, making their employees access their personal pcs personal network that means highly like elevating their security levels um to the highest level that doesn't happen automatically every every business is not equipped with having that kind of a technology or systems around so there's a huge opportunity for collaboration from different ecosystem partners to come forward for like one of the examples that i could give you is i work with an electrical company to do a digital transformation transformation so they had very basic erp system when i started engaging with them early january when we started discussing they were totally against uh, so many different things the change in culture we talked about uh, how the system should be elevated investment into technology all that were like very they were very uh, resisting to the change 3 months post that march and they said let's do this entire transformation in one month's time now they're swinging completely into a different um a strategy that they had originally and we feel okay um i think prashanti has had a bit of a 
Let me, let me, well, and I think Rakesh or two had to drop off and he just sent me a message that he's trying to get back in. Maybe for the three panelists that are, are still connected here, you know, we've always talked about even before going into COVID-19 as Indian business that, you know, we need lots of growth. We have to create jobs. I mean, that's fundamental thesis. And even the Indian economy was slowing down in the last few quarters of last year before COVID hit. So now people are talking about, you know, let's now focus on culture and employees and everything else. But what about the fundamental issue of the fact is that we still have to create all these jobs. That issue is not going away. And in fact, it probably got even worse. So how should business be thinking about that topic? And I, I'm sorry, Rakesh, you just came back in. Let me just finish this question and then I'll come back to you for your comments. Yeah. I don't know. I, who would like to take that? So, do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah. So, basically, I think the way businesses have to look at it, and that's why, especially in a country like India, there will be two roles, which I said in my uh, early statement also, that working with governments at this stage will become very important. One thing we must realize in India, we have a socialist mindset. Uh, the, our culture, basically, more particularly in the last some time, I believe, and that's my personal assessment, is that we are going a lot more with the socialist mindset. And therefore, it will be very important for corporates and businesses to work along with government to find solutions to this job problem. Because otherwise, I believe that in pockets, there will be a lot of social unrest coming in. We already see it and it will evolve and increase if this is not addressed. So therefore, that is the reason why I said, I said that as a corporate citizen, it becomes very important for us to engage with governments to work out solutions together to this problem. And it's not an easy solution. It's not, there's no easy answer. But working together, we'll be able to address it in that local environment, whether at the state level or at the local level. Yeah, Pra? Yeah, so I think a good, good analogy to kind of follow is uh, when Uber came about, it created a tremendous amount of jobs, millions of jobs worldwide. And it was purely a technology play. It was not a transportation play. It was not a taxi play. It was a tech play because transportation existed, taxis existed. It was a, a, a tech way of dealing with an existing business model. Mm -hmm. And it created millions of jobs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, similarly, what's going to happen is when we talk about opportunities, companies are going to have to pivot along those lines. They're going to have to say, how do I do something? 15 years ago, when Prime Minister Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat, is when we had said to him that a million Indians are going to join the workforce every month for 35 years. Yeah. And yeah. Hence, your startup India mission, right? So that, that focus has not changed. The government still understands that that problem stands. But yeah. the yeah. government is going to be able to create a million jobs. No one, nobody in the world. So it is yeah. entrepreneurs that have to create jobs. Government's job should be to have a mission that says every household should have an entrepreneur. That entrepreneur's mission should be from the circle of my influence. I want to hire 20 or 30 people. Now you suddenly yeah. cut the quantum of the problem from a million down by a factor of 30. But and how do these individual small businesses, entrepreneurs create solutions? Exactly by pivoting. Large companies are not going to be able to. We have a company at iCreate that built a negative ion solution. That's like a light bulb that you basically install in a 10 by 14 room and it it makes the room COVID free in under an hour. Now, they would have not built a solution three months ago. Correct. So one would hope that, that actually COVID is going to accelerate technology innovation. And that's really the, 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 the bright light. And maybe is that is that would that be a fair assessment? Yep, absolutely. You will have to pivot regardless of what you are. You will have to pivot. And in the pivot, you will have to keep in mind, how do you pivot creating jobs, right? Yeah. So people let me, not, let, me, uh, let, me, let me bring it in after I, Rakesh hasn't had a chance yet. He got cut off from the conference. So Rakesh, why don't you give us your thoughts uh, and then we'll carry on the discussion. I think it's not just innovation, but uh, if you look at like a space like India, like you know, a lot of people haven't really adapted to technology, but they are doing at this moment. In the last three months, things that they didn't do over the past three years are things what they're doing. They are adapting to technology. They are, they are being more forward thinking, uh, trying to incorporate what they can in terms of technology to improve or continue their business. I'm talking about brick and mortar business, uh, businesses which haven't uh, had the need to, you know, adapt to technology uh, for all of this while. 
all of a sudden they they taking the leap of faith to you know move in terms of ensuring that technology is going to help them uh, move forward with their business a small shop small small uh, you know places as well like everybody um, utilizing this this particular i, I would as a, I, i think uh, sunil has said this this being an opportunity per se this mm-hmm. is particularly an opportunity for people to actually make that leap um because they've been always thinking this is something that i don't need this is something that i you know it is uh, not necessary for me i would continue doing what i do irrespective of that today uh, that doesn't seem the world has changed and people are also adapting to that right now yeah but you know one of the things which uh, prashanti said uh, sorry sunil you are to come in before i go to the next topic you you are you know what i said i just wanted to add uh, to what amin said is that absolutely right uh the entrepreneurship in the country is huge and strong where the challenge happens in the implementation the where i was talking when you interact with you need to interact with the government is the rules regulations policies uh, uh you need to create a congenial environment and that congenial environment for env- uh, entrepreneurs and grow i see many we work out with a lot of startups and all i see them struggling just because of not because of the opportunity but because of the challenges of the rules and regulations the talk about start india when the, when the implementation happens it strangles you that's where we need to correct that and that's where uh, businesses with government need to work together to ensure that the balance is created but but sunil if i may push back on that a little bit that comment would be true before covid when we are not even heard about covid that comment would be true right that there's a lot of entrepreneurship it gets suppressed all these things so do you think the covid situ- i mean what you just said is absolutely correct but you could have said it in december also and it would be correct So the question yeah. really the question really is what what will change as a result of covid do you think the government will will accelerate and businesses will accelerate change in front as a result of this or what will happen no i think that is what is required to happen because you see if you look at the last two months many of the policies government has come out with but to my mind we have i have been interacting a lot uh, with this government and working out on policy matters most of the solutions are not sustainable solution this calls problem yes some of them have done well some of them will work but many of not has not so it is a journey where i believe both have to work together to make it happen yeah rajiv yeah so th- th- this is actually a very important point uh, one of the things uh, uh, consequences to my mind of the covid-19 crisis across the world is that the role of governments um has been uh, made more important and actually going forward uh, uh right wrong good bad the reality is that governments will have to play a more proactive role across the board whether it's in the delivery of public goods public health uh but also in being supportive and collaborative with uh the private sector now this is where and if this is the reality if this is the objective reality of what is required of the states of a state going forward then we have to really carefully reflect and act in the case of india because the relationship between government and the private sector has been particularly difficult and if unless both parties step up to Sunil's point right and and find ways of collaborating we will as a country uh, be significantly disadvantaged relative to those that are able to get this collaborative model right yeah. that's it yeah so so on uh, if i if i ask a question where a lot of the jobs and a lot of the focus going for a government in this public private partnership is probably in infrastructure right and in a, in a if, if you take infrastructure for a second that a lot of the migrant workers and everything else has impacted potential ramp up of infrastructure going forward how does uh, what is what is happening differently in the context of boardrooms of infrastructure companies how are they going to be dealing with this in a different way going forward so we can i ask you to kind of think about that could you repeat the last few words no so in terms of infrastructure companies right their public private partnerships are critical there that one two is that is the tool which which you can get the economy going back again creating the jobs etc 
But at the same time, you have a lot of this migrant labor problem. You've got all these other issues. So will the infrastructure model going forward change or is this going to be a little bit of a crisis for a while and then things will be back to as they were before? I think uh, there will be a crisis and we are in that crisis at the moment because being in that space and we are seeing it all across, whether it is roads, whether it is airports and all sectors of the infrastructure we have a play and we are seeing that challenge is basically that with this uh, rebooting which is happening, the business models are changing in terms of business cash flows are changing. So therefore, how you work with governments to renegotiate the agreements and contracts will be very important. And today, that is the biggest challenge because when it is a public infrastructure, the question happens that uh, is the private sector going to benefit more? And therefore, the socialist mindset does not allow the governments to act appropriately to ensure that balance. And therefore, the balance is always against the private sector. If you see in the past, and this is my concern, and therefore it becomes very important to work closely with the government to see that you create how you create an independent fair solution which is a win-win for public and the private sector also that becomes very important it's a journey we have to see how it goes so let me let me put a, a, a kind of a hypothesis there okay so the hypothesis is that we are right now in crisis mode and in India elsewhere also that 2020 essentially is a write-off from a business standpoint, or even an economy standpoint, country standpoint. So forget about 2020's history, it didn't exist. And we are back now, we're in the middle of 2021. There's some vaccine has been occurred, there's et cetera, et cetera. Things have got a little more settled. Will we go back to business as usual? Why, why would we not? Why would people not start traveling again? Why would we end? Why won't we not next year have a Horaces conference that's live as opposed to on TV? What won't things be back? I mean, it's it's easy to kind of talk about this thing in a frenzy when you're in a crisis. But what will fundamentally be different a year and a half from now that that this will cause? I, my thesis is that I'm just saying my one hypothesis is yes, things will go down and and Parag, you said 30 percent capacity will be cut off. You could make the argument, you know, people like to be with each other, people like to travel, people like to see each other, people like to go and visit places, and all that will come back. So. What, what's, uh, do you agree with me? Disagree with me? Sorry, you're on, you're on mute, Parag. You're on mute. Parag, you're on mute. Mute. Am I? Yeah. Am I yeah. Audible yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm in complete agreement with you. Matter of fact, uh, July 6th, I am flying to Netherlands and I will be on a ship for three weeks working. So against all family advice, doctor's advice, I'm one of the first guys that's going to get on a plane. <laughs> and I'm going to go out and do my business, right? What yeah, I mean, is it a carnival cruise line ship? It, 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 it is one of the ships, yes, correct. It is. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is 9-11 uh, happened. People stopped traveling for a little bit. Everybody else came back to traveling. But you being fixed out of all your crevices has not gone away. TSA got, got developed as an agency. And the fact that there's always going to be that fear of this happening again, a systemic fear, is never going to go away. Because this is such a large event, there is nothing to say that there might not be another virus like this or a mutation of this virus that is just as deadly and whatever cures you have found are not going to work. So that, that inherent, I'll give you an example. I'm a diehard Philadelphia Eagles fan. They're a football team here in Philadelphia. The ticket, you have to wait for 15 years to get season tickets. There's a waiting list for 15 years. These tickets have been held in families for 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. The father that is 75, 80 years old does not want to the, go to the game anymore. And these tickets are now freely available. You can buy season tickets and, and become a season ticket holder. Now, that mindset in people that feel vulnerable to a phenomenon, a pandemic, is not something we can be able to change. You and I will start traveling, even before the government says it's okay. Right? But then there's a whole segment of society that will contribute to that 30%. And that's why the new norm will be the norm. And that 30% might draw back and become a 20% evaporation. But the new norm is going to stay, in my opinion. I don't think it, it, it resets back to its original uh, norm. 
the, the fear of a pandemic coming back and things like that would cause some issues. Rakesh, do you want to come in? Yeah, like um, the general population, they, they're going to be doing the things that they used to do always. Like that's not going to change much. But at the same time, from the corporate standpoint, if you look like uh, travel, for example, travel for purposes that you don't have to travel. Today, you realize like there are things that you don't have to, you don't have to travel for, you don't have to spend for. Those things are going to come down. Again, the cost and infrastructure that they're going to put in, like, you know, uh, the, the spaces that they have rented out or leased out uh, for the time being. Uh, you know, people are working from home. You see that productivity has actually gone up. Uh, but again, balancing that with the you know, corporate culture or the culture that you've been maintaining, uh, you know, that has only happened due to people interacting with each other face to face, right? Now they have to still balance that corporate culture, but at the same time, stay at home and, you know, work from home scenario is something that is also a challenge that they, that's going to happen, uh, you know, from now on. So people you are going to... So you, you, you yeah. also mentioned the employees again, and, and a lot of the other panelists have also talked about employees and importance of employees versus customers, uh, you know, uh, culture, purpose. So all these things, I mean, if you look at corporate, you know, uh, I teach at a business school. So if you look at all the stuff is there in all business school literature, we've been teaching this for like donkey's years. So what, what is, what is going to change right now? <laughs> about corporate purpose and culture and, and employees. I mean, all these things have always been important. So what, what do you think has, what, what actually will change? If you were like on the board of a company, what will that company be doing differently as a result of COVID-19 that it wasn't doing before? Yeah. I, think, Sunil. I think the key is upskilling and reskilling your people. Uh, because as Amin said that your people are key assets in the business. If I have to look at my business, you have to look at that one, uh, you look at what the changes would happen and how do you upskill your people and develop and uh, motivate them to see that they invest in themselves to look at that change. And as you develop that, opportunities will come. And I believe that in the earlier question, I believe that in a certain generation, all this will be forgotten. Uh, after a certain period, our young uh, generation, you'll forget what a pandemic was. It be would become a history book uh, story only. So we will come back to normal. But the thing, uh, we will come back to a good growth levels in some time. I'm very optimistic about it. But in a different way, there will be certain business model which will evolve. And in the next few years is where the pain would be. When this fear is high and it gradually comes down. I think the next generation, the one thing they won't forget is when they have to sit at home for six months doing Zoom calls and Zoom video training and Zoom classes <laughs> and have their parents on the, around them all day long. <laughs> That's something that will be embedded in their memory. Yeah, Raji, yeah. you want to do something? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, it really depends on uh, how long the crisis lasts and what the experience of the general population is through that crisis. And one of the analogies that has been used in this context is war. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the Second World War, um, or you think about Korea uh, or Japan immediately after the Second World War, there was a great resurgence of nationalist sentiment um, and, you know, everybody from top down, whether it was government, whether it was people in business, whether it was the average citizen, there was this sense of proving to the world that they are no less than anybody else. So it gave them a sense of national purpose that actually changed and uh, modified behavior. Now, it's not clear that this crisis is going to lead to that kind of behavioral change. I, I can't I can't prognosticate, but in theory, uh, if if there are you know if, if the number of deaths continues um, and every second or third family has been personally affected by COVID, then my hypothesis my hypothesis would be that this will induce behavioral change, and when you have that context, then you can get a number of things to actually change permanently. If not, we will come back. As you were saying, to normal, people will forget this. Greed will take over. We will forget the long term. We will keep worrying about the short term until, of course, the next crisis hits. Of course. Yeah. The greed versus uh, fear. The greed versus <laughs> fear trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rakesh, you were trying, trying to get it? 
um so i, I think like you know how uh, rajiv was explaining like you know the war times and all of that uh, back in the day like i used to ask my grandfather how was it to actually be on a world war 2 situation like can today people are going to ask us like in the future like how was covid like you know how was the lockdown and we never know if this is the last lockdown or is it going to continue or how how things are going to change up as well yeah the other thing which i just want to touch on yes go ahead uh, so you're on mute again but one other thing that i was quickly going to say from a corporate perspective i sit the uh, innovation advisory board for carnival cruise lines they are a 50 billion dollar company one of the questions that they posed is using technology how do we pivot or what do we do differently we already know how to do our business well so one of the things that that i had put to the panel was that as, as a cruise company you have never thought about the customer you only thought about your product you don't you don't ever wonder how the customer gets from their house to the airport you never wonder how they get from the airport to the cruise terminal you never wonder whether they stay in a hotel before they board your cruise or not well what you are going to have to do now is cruising is an equation in a customer's lifetime that starts at their house and ends on your ship and you are now going to have to go and collaborate with the marriotts of the world with the deltas of the world with the hertz of the world and kind of create a more conducive environment for that guest both from a financial perspective ease of transition perspective safety perspective covid anything that you can think of so companies have to start thinking not about just their little silo and their shareholders and their profit centers but about the customer first on how do i serve their whole uh, slice of what they're trying to do and i think that in itself is going to be huge and 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 rajiv one of the guys asked you a question about savings today us just announced 3.2 trillion dollars have been put into bank savings accounts in the last 3 months us is not truly a saving economy we earn and spend but yeah. Yeah. 3 trillion dollars has been put into the bank saving accounts so yeah. i think is inherent fear and people are saving yeah. yeah absolutely and you know there are obviously industries like you mentioned the travel industry the leisure industry etc which will have to totally rethink on the same time on the other side there is obviously a massive i mean if you look at just the stock market reaction whether in india or elsewhere you know people say well the stock market is exactly where it was or somewhere close to where it was 7 8 8 months ago and the whole world is in chaos like why is that well if you break it down you know the tech companies the other companies that are actually benefiting from this their stocks have skyrocketed and the airlines and the hotels and the carnival cruises have totally taken a beating so in a way the market is behaving rationally and the opportunity is on technology plays education i mean i think personally yeah, that that education and and what happened over here will actually transform education in quite a dramatic manner and actually make it uh, democratize it significantly more one quick uh, quick comment quickly from each one of you is to if you had to leave the audience with one thought uh, in terms of the implications of covid what would that be we got we got a minute and a half left so maybe i'll start with you again for our Yes I, I I say this is a reset moment whether you are an entrepreneur whether you are an employee whether you are a leader or you are a board member this is a reset moment take an inside look and reset whatever you have to reset start with a new beginning thank you basically as i said in the early stage it starts from the self so we have to look at within ourselves exercise our mind body and soul yeah this is your spiritual uh, your spiritual mindset coming out here which is very good excellent we need that i mean you know the the other thing which is glaring is the income inequality that covid has you know while we are sitting in our homes doing all this uh, the devastation that it's created on the streets is quite something hey, rajiv yeah so i i think that um uh, from a business perspective uh this is a moment to shake up the boards and and urge them to think consistently about the longer term and about broader stakeholder interests um any company that ignores this message from the pandemic is going to do this at its peril long term yeah the, the business purpose of the business and stakeholders versus shareholders yeah got yeah. to get the final last word here i think i think i would like go with parag as well like you know i call it reform rather than reset wherein like you keep your like you know you you have your survival instinct keep the st- ship steady but at the same time keep your peripherals open for threats and new opportunities that coming your way and a lot of them are coming your way thank you rakesh well thank you very much uh, please uh, the audience please join me in thanking all our panelists that was that was very helpful very insightful and 
We really appreciate your time. So thank you very much, and uh, see you soon in thank person. You. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.